Between 1960 and 1970, 10 more major hotels would open on both the Strip and Fremont Street. At the same time, established hotels like the Dunes and the Sands were expanding, with high-rise towers to accommodate the ever-growing number of guests coming to be entertained. The Sands was home to the most popular act of the time, a musical and comedy show starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, and Joey Bishop. Fans lovingly referred to the group as the Rat Pack. You can get high watching this show. You set me all aflame, and it's so pleasing. Be a goddamn shame if you were only teasing. When Sinatra was here, every night was New Year's Eve. I mean, it was really exciting. But he made guys like Trini Lopez, I mean, by merely showing up where Trini was working down on Crescent Heights Boulevard in L.A., Frank took the guys in there two or three or four nights, the word got out, and the joint was a tremendous success, and that was the beginning of Trini's career. In the winter of 1960, the Rat Pack stars performed evening shows at the Sands while filming the Las Vegas-based motion picture, Ocean's Eleven. How'd it come off? Like a charm. Same here, fantastic. Along with the 1964 Elvis Presley musical, Viva Las Vegas, Ocean's Eleven helped play up the excitement and entertainment the town had to offer. The films defined Las Vegas in American pop culture for years to come. Truthfully, if my heart's in the right place, the entertainment capital was here in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then when Howard Hughes got here, everything shifted, and the winds changed, and a lot of the ships just sailed away and never came back. On Thanksgiving weekend in 1966, reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas in a two-car private train and took up residence on the top floor of the Desert Inn. And you have to Im imagine that uh, here we were uh, occupying the best, the best uh, accommodations in the hotel. All of, of the Hughes entourage never gambled. We were, not, we were not good tenants for a hotel. We didn't gamble, we didn't have big parties, we didn't have big dinners, and uh, they were getting sick and tired of us, and I mean for real. Finally, when faced with the possibility of being kicked out, Hughes bought the Desert Inn from Cleveland mobster Mo Dalitz for nearly $13 million. Soon afterwards, Hughes realized that his recent sale of Transworld Airlines had left him in an unfavorable tax position that could be best remedied by investing in new businesses. He said, Bob, how many more of these toys are available? I said, what do you mean toys? He said, I mean, how many more of these casinos are available? Increased government investigations influenced many of the mob-based casino owners to sell their hotels. At that particular time, Las Vegas was in dire straits and came along a man who could, for all practical purposes, clean up the image of Las Vegas. And so, during his four years living on the top floor of the Desert Inn, Hughes would buy the Sands, the Frontier, the Castaways, the Silver Slipper, and the Landmark Hotels. He left Las Vegas just as quietly as he came, moving again on Thanksgiving in 1970. But as Howard Hughes was paving the way to a new corporate control of Las Vegas, city leaders realized that the growing demand for water meant a need for serious change in distribution. Officials turned to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was then enacting a large number of domestic programs. Senator Howard Cannon and Alan Bible convinced Johnson to build the Southern Nevada Water Project, a major pipeline from Lake Mead directly into Las Vegas. You've got to have water if you're going to have a large population in a big city. By 1969, like many other parts of the country, Las Vegas was divided on the issue of racial integration. Though Vegas casinos had integrated in 1960, school and housing segregation still existed. And in October of 1969, a full-scale riot erupted for two days, causing Governor Paul Laxalt to mobilize the National Guard. Various protests continued for the next few years, giving the tourism-driven town much unwanted publicity. 
More negative press would follow in the 1970s when an underground novel showed America the dark side of Vegas.